Welcome to Macro Peace Theater. I'm your host, Emil Kalinowski. Today's reading is a very important one by Jeffrey P. Snyder. I read so much of his work. This one is a special one. I encourage you to read it yourself. Uh, there are some numbers, and it may get confusing when I'm reading them out. So if you read it yourself, I think you may get a better grasp of the situation. You can find it at Real Clear Markets, posted on the 8th of October, 2021. It is called, The U.S. Economy Remains as Frozen as Ever. And here, Jeff explains what it would take for him to change his mind that we are not in a terrible economic situation. He finally gives the answer. He also gives uh, an analogy, a comparison, a bridge from present day to the Great Depression. He makes a comparison and how similar some of the banking data is today. Enjoy. It would be remembered as Snowmageddon. On February 5th and 6th, 2010, the DC Beltway area was blanketed with almost 18 inches of the freezing white stuff, the fourth worst blizzard to strike the area since anyone had been keeping track. At Dulles, it would end up being the snowiest, that airport recording an impressive 32.4 inches. Needless to say, much of the federal government came to a screeching halt. The government, at least, would quickly recover. This was a metaphor of sorts, not one lost on millions upon millions of the nation's working peoples, or formerly working. They had just completed a year, the worst for them since the Great Depression, when it seemed for reasons no one could adequately identify, the entire U.S. and global economy simply iced, the entire global system frozen to a complete stop. Then Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke had been scheduled to appear before the House of Representatives Financial Services Committee on February 9th, but continued bad weather forced a one-day postponement. It had been the same body which previously rubber-stamped their approval on a second term for the guy, despite what was supposed to have been substantial opposition. Anyone remember, audit the Fed? A joke today. In late 2009, this was seen as something of a real threat. People were rightly angry, and Bernanke hadn't told them much, aside from selling politicians in particular, on the idea he had saved the world. Many were, incredibly, willing to go along with this. Yet even his supporters had to reluctantly acknowledge someone eventually should have answered for why there had been a global financial crisis in the first place. After all, it was none other than Governor Ben Bernanke standing before Milton Friedman several years earlier, in 2002, promising, we won't do it again, stating the Fed had made critical errors of monetary misjudgment before and during the Great Collapse beginning in 1929, which then became the Great Depression. More than a few, if not enough, began to wonder if the Federal Reserve System had actually done it again. The November prior to all that D.C. snow job in 2009 November, Vincent Reinhardt uneasily speculated if the situation had finally caught up with the institution. A former director of the Central Bank's Division of Monetary Affairs, Reinhardt could easily sense the growing backlash which included broad support for audit the Fed. At least on the Federal Reserve part, Congress is going to converge on something that's tougher on the Fed. It's a way to vent anger, and fundamentally, people are angry. The people, both right and left, were enraged about the costs, the symptoms. More than anything, the fact that it was the global workforce which bore the brunt of the disaster without any answers coming from anyone. Subprime mortgages? Yeah. No. What Bern Bernanke told the House Committee, the same one which cleared the way for his second term, after that term had already been confirmed by full vote not even two weeks before, was an astounding, if fleeting, bit of honesty. Yes, honesty. Safely ensconced in another four years, and not yet bothered by having to undertake a second QE in as many years, the chairman maybe felt some space to speak a tiny bit more candidly. Hardly anyone picked up on it. 
maybe because it was such a rare occasion. Of the few who might have, no one appears to have understood what they were hearing at this later hearing. While buried under such heavy snow outdoors, the coldest shudder was saved for the concealed confession taking place inside the capital. Liquidity pressures in financial markets were not limited to the United States, and intense strains in the global dollar funding markets began to spill over to the U.S. markets. In response, the Federal Reserve entered into temporary currency swap agreements with major foreign central banks. Notice what he's saying, prefacing it with a little of not my fault. These liquidity pressures were worldwide. So if the Fed screwed up, it was hardly alone. Safety in numbers, presumably. But that's not the key part. This is... Intense strains in the global dollar funding markets began to spill over to U.S. markets. In other words, the entire affair began overseas and then struck the mighty United States, safeguarded by its exemplary Fed, who somehow was rendered completely vulnerable to such massive damage. Immediately after, Bernanke runs to his post-crisis playbook. Yes, it was bad, but the Fed's actions after it happened limited the downside consequences, even though those consequences were the worst since the 30s. Those overseas dollar swaps, the chairman told reps, had been effective in his judgment. The swaps help reduce stresses in global dollar funding markets, which in turn helped to stabilize U.S. markets. And yet, two sentences later, he goes on to describe, As the financial crisis spread, the continuing pullback of private funding contributed to illiquid and even chaotic conditions in financial markets and prompted runs on various types of financial institutions, including primary dealers and money market mutual funds. From helped to stabilize to as the financial crisis spread without anyone calling him on his obvious cover-up. Just how effective were these swaps if what he said ended up the result anyway? This is, of course, a rhetorical question, and it is the only question for us today. As Reinhardt said, people were fundamentally angry. They remain angry to this day, though like then they have no idea why. The world seems to be broken, and nothing Chairman Bernanke did fixed it. Not later in 2010 with a second QE, nor in 2012 with a third and fourth. Yes, there were four by December 2012. What happened was as simple as it was misunderstood, and it never should have been so badly misconstrued. Aided by a compliant world media, these QEs were characterized, as they had been from the beginning years earlier in Japan, as pouring trillions of dollars into the real economy. This wasn't even appropriate as a euphemism for QE. No part of that description is factually true. QEs create bank reserves, full stop. Those are neither dollars, nor do they get poured anywhere except on a commercial bank's balance sheet. It does not matter how many times someone says they are base money or that QE is money printing. The issue with bank reserves has been settled years and years before this global dollar mess ever showed up. And I'm not just talking about Japanese failure with quantitative easing from the start of the 2000s. This is one reason why it is so frustrating while also tragic. Bernanke supposedly knew most, at least according to what everyone in economics said, about the fractures and weaknesses which had once led to the Great Depression. Yet in our moment of need, which, as Bernanke told Congress in February 2010, he turned monetary policy over to bank reserves, which had zero role in either lessening that prior great collapse or fostering any recovery from it. The reason for so much of suffering during the Great Depression wasn't just in the near-total implosion, 
Rather, it was how that breakdown changed the very nature of the monetary environment from then onward until Bretton Woods redrew the monetary landscape a long time and a world war later. As the planet would see again in Japan six decades later, it is banks, not bank reserves, which determine the outcome during the collapse and then following. In late 1936, despite the fact that recovery was then not yet in sight, the Federal Reserve policymakers at the time began to consider inflation their biggest threat. Sound familiar? The reason again was a huge buildup of excess bank reserves as gold flowed into the U.S. after dollar devaluation. The FOMC's minutes of the November 1936 meeting aptly summarizes both sides, actually, in theory versus reality. First up, bank reserves. Consideration was given particularly to the question whether it would be preferable for the Board of Governors to use its power to further increase reserve requirements. Inasmuch as it was understood that excess reserves are fairly generally distributed among member banks, and an increase in reserve requirements probably would work no hardship on any substantial number of member banks, or for the Federal Open Market Committee to reduce the total holdings of government securities in the system open market account, which might be interpreted as a reversal of the present easy money policy. Many were now concerned how so many reserves would inevitably unleash a tidal wave of inflationary credit. Therefore, policymakers, newly empowered by the Bank Act of 1935, needed to get in front of it, right out of the mouths of current-day experts. Too much liquidity, they surmised. The very next sentence of those same meeting minutes, however, should have ended the discussion right then. In this connection, reference was made as indicating that time had not yet arrived for a reversal of policy to the continuing large amount of unemployment, to the fact that there is still unused productive capacity, and to the relatively low aggregate of national income in the United States, together with the fact that there is no general indication of unhealthy growth in the use of bank credit. In short, the economy hadn't recovered at all, was still grossly and dangerously impaired, and much, if not the vast majority, despite the New Deal, had been due to the fact that there is no general indication of unhealthy growth in the use of bank credit. On the contrary, there is still every reason to believe, and unambiguous data to show, the monetary banking system was still every bit depressionary, even seven years after the prior peak. The Federal Reserve's very own contemporary data displayed the unbroken ugliness of it all. At the peak, in Q4 1929, Federal Reserve member banks reported $35.9 billion in total assets, of which $26.2 billion were loans. By the fourth quarter of 1936, banks had rebuilt their portfolios back to $33.0 billion, from an obscene low of $24.8. But only $13.4 billion had been loans. Rather than lend, which is the whole point, the banking system instead couldn't get nearly enough U.S. Treasuries. In fact, the more the government went into deficit to fund the New Deal, the more USTs they offered, which the banking system bought up at higher and higher prices. In Q4 1929, member banks held less than $4 billion of government bonds and the like. By 1936, a better than threefold increase to $13.5 billion. This is not just the interest rate fallacy identified and illuminated, it speaks to the more fundamental monetary issue behind depressionary economics, which seems to have escaped Ben Bernanke's worldview, along with every other late 20th, early 21st century economist. Le lending isn't just trying to rebuild busted mortgages after pop bubbles. 
It is the very essence of monetary redistribution. This is, after all, what banks are supposed to be and what their central role is in any healthy economy. Intermediation. The banking system should take in money or create it and then reallocate it throughout the economy as needed. It is the presumed expertise of the banking system which leads to necessary efficiency so as to create and maintain sustainable economic growth. Loans, unlike liquid assets such as bonds, are how money flows to what would otherwise be underserved, therefore illiquid and depressive parts of the economic whole. Without lending, as during the aftermath of the Great Collapse, at best partial recovery, which isn't nearly good enough. Absent redistribution via bank intermediation, too much of the economy is left without monetary resources, which then congregate in two narrow spaces. Such as the bond market for government issues, financing wasteful, inefficient government spending that would otherwise be better directed elsewhere but can't be without lending. This crystal clear preference for the safest and most liquid assets over lending, and not just government bonds, any kind of liquid debt security, is likewise a clear indication of exactly what's wrong, safety and liquidity. The banking system of the 30s didn't just prioritize those characteristics, they lived them to the point that the system reinvented itself to operate under these conditions. The Fed's bank reserves didn't matter, and so the recovery never happened. Some members of the 1936 FOMC got that much right before they were overruled by economic theory. In the fourth quarter of 2008, the domestic U.S. banking system totaled $14.4 trillion in assets, of which $8.5 trillion were loans. On the other hand, only $102 billion in USTs along with $1.4 trillion of GSC debt securities, a treasury equivalent. As of the latest data for Q2 2021, bank assets total up $24.4 trillion, comprised of just $12 trillion in lending, while $1.3 trillion in USTs, along with an astounding $3.7 trillion of GSEs. Loans, which had made up about 60% of bank assets when Bernanke was saving the world, are now for the first time since 1955 less than 50%. And these totals don't take in any account for rates of growth, which have declined substantially since 2007, a complete regime shift in the aftermath of intense strains in global dollar funding markets began to spill over to U.S. markets. Like the 30s, if not to the same degree, the banking system has abandoned too much of its redistribution function in favor of the safest and most liquid. During the first half of this year, the same six months when claims of out-of-control inflation were at their highest and most hysterical yet, the U.S. banking system somehow added another 146 billion of U.S. Treasuries to go along with an additional 354 billion of safe, liquid GSE bonds. Those, together with a 516 billion increase in bank reserves, account for more than the net increase in total assets. One reason why lending declined by $25 billion at the same time. Just like the 30s, again in Japan in the 90s forward, and Europe concurrent to everything I've written here, it's not bank reserves, but banks, which determine whether recovery or not. Ben Bernanke claimed to have saved the banking system, yet by its own actions and behavior, this cannot have been true. Because it is a global dollar system which broke first, the banking system globally merely responded in kind and did so in a way which should have been familiar to especially Mr. Ben Bernanke more than anyone else on the planet. 
Alas, he'd been too busy trying to cram his global savings glut nonsense into where the actual global reserve money, euro dollar, came from. Pondering the potential actions of his successor's successor, Mr. J. Powell, it really does not matter what he does. Taper, rate hikes, more QEs, even another QT. People ask me all the time what it would take for me to change positions, to climb aboard the inflation view that somehow only, ch only gains adherence the longer we go without any, or any answers for why this is. My answer remains the same and incredibly simple, banking and redistribution. Without these, nothing has changed and therefore nothing will. Therefore, there may be bouts of consumer price deviations, deviations along the way, see 2008 and 10. Without the intermediation, they'll never be more than transitory. The blizzard which struck the monetary world first all those years ago never thawed. The deep snows of safety and liquidity preferences piled as high as ever on a frigid real economy, unable to dig itself out from under the disaster. The promised fires and heat of inflation nowhere to be found, not in any real sense outside the overbaked rhetoric. The economy remains as frozen, its workers frozen out as ever. I hope you enjoyed that reading. It was a very important reading. And I encourage you to read it yourself because I was unable to give it the emphasis and the due that it was required, that was required. Why? Because I've read this like three times now because of technical snafus and I am positively depressed that I'm doing it over and over. So frustrating. But people, this was such a good piece and the information was so important in it. The first time I finished it, I actually said, you know what I need? I feel like I need a cigarette after this because I was jacked. I was just thrilled. It was so important. And I, and I had the enthusiasm to convey that and I did the piece justice. But technical snafus have beaten me down. So I recommend, ladies and gentlemen, that you read through it yourself. It was again posted at Real Clear Markets on the 8th of October, 2021, under the title, The U.S. Economy Remains as Frozen as Ever. And here you'll hear actual data from the Great Depression, from our current silent depression, showing what a lousy situation we are when it comes to bank credit creation. Net loans in the most recent six months of 2021 shrank disaster disaster and then very importantly at the end jeff explains what it would take for him to climb aboard the inflation train choo choo yeah to be the conductor of it right there at the end this is the thing that needs to change all right ladies and gentlemen i am recording this at 5 50 a.m but that doesn't mean i'm not gonna go get a stiff drink right after this recording. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day and I'll talk to you later.